Hello and welcome to Springboard Your Virtual University. My name is Albert Okran, matriculating you into Ghana's foremost personal developmental program running since 2008. This is your most inspirational show and that place where the greatest minds in the world converge. Your Virtual University is brought to you by the Springboard Ratio Foundation and proudly sponsored by the Enterprise Group, MTN Pulse, UMB Bank, with media support from the multimedia group and the graphic business. So today, by popular request, we launch that big one you've been waiting for for quite a while since we announced it. Absolutely special, unprecedented, and if I may add, quite competitive show for our universities. The Don's Conclave right here on Springboard, your virtual university. So throughout this month, We'll be featuring five of our finest vice chancellors or heads of tertiary educational institutions, sharing their five key leadership lessons and very importantly, their five prescriptions for world-class education in Ghana. So let me tell you why you must be very, very interested. If you are a student, alumnus, faculty, staff, friend of any of these selected universities or if you, you yourself or your ward is planning to attend please incline your ears and your eyes to the show and find out the promise what is happening in your favorite university and even more vote engage challenge and discuss the thoughts that will be shared on this platform and i'll be showing you very shortly how you can be part of this amazing experience. My first guest naturally is from my alma mater, the vice chancellor, and if I may add, the first female vice chancellor of the University of Ghana, Professor Naba Apia Amfu. Prof, good to see you and congratulations. Good to see you too. Thank you. It's been a while. I have been waiting for this conversation <laughs> since you were last year. As you were here the last time as pro vice chancellor. Yeah, I may add on behalf correct. of Comfort myself and the entire Springboard team. Congratulations. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm glad you chose right to start it right. I know, I know, I know. I mean, it had, it had to be easy to start. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Prof, let's start with, with, with the role you play. How, how hot is your seat as vice chancellor? <laughs> well, it's, it's very hot. I mean, as you know, it's the nation's premier university. I must say that it's the eye of the nation. Everyone thinks that they do have a stake at the University of Ghana, rightly or wrongly. Uh, so it it's, can be quite complicated. You have your internal stakeholders to satisfy the students, the staff, the faculty, parents. Uh, you, I mean, you also have other stakeholders, you know, those are uh, parents, uh, the government, literally everybody, you know, everyone in Ghana uh, feels some connection to the University of Ghana. And it's, it's we've grown over the years. Now, uh, now we have four colleges. We have uh, over 61,000 students. We have learning centers across the regions. We have our local and international uh, partners, uh, we have our industry partners, so it, it can be quite complicated, but by God's grace, we, we, we're doing a pretty good job at that. <laughs> I, I, I believe so. I mean, I, I, I threw my mind back to Legon as it was uh, when we were there in 1987 for our first year with Professor Akila Kwasoya as the Vice Chancellor, and I think that the complications have the multi-dimensional, multi-faceted nature of the university uh, is, is definitely much more complex and the issue is more intense than when we were there. But before we go into your lessons, how important is this conversation? I, mean, I must tell you, since we announced this was coming up, you have no idea how everyone wants to hear their university and everyone wants to hear what you have to say. If this, this, absolutely high levels of interest. How critical is this conversation about education and for that matter, higher education and world-class education at a time like this? I think that education is critical in the development of every nation. 
right? And higher education is at the apex of it. And so definitely from time to time, we need to talk about our education, the system, you know, how we are managing our teaching and learning processes, because these directly feed into the human resource that we are building for our nation. And these are the people who would drive uh, leadership in our nation. When we look at the leadership space, uh, when we look at the people in, in government, the executive, the legislature, the judiciary, managing big companies in this uh, country. I mean, the majority of these people have been through tertiary education. So it's important that we get these things right if we are going to build a prosperous and a vibrant nation. I love that. Prosperous and vibrant <laughs> Ghana. It's beautiful. Prof, let's settle down to the first part of our conversation because for all our viewers and listeners, they need to know who is Professor Naba Piam and what are the what is inside your engine? What are the lessons that undergird your life? What have you discovered on the path to where you are today? That that young person looking up to you, wanting to be the next first something, can see. Okay, this must be a contributing factor that I can learn from. So, um, if you can take us through five helpful lessons or learnings that you've garnered on this journey we can amplify them for the benefit of uh <laughs> viewers and listeners and and by the way before prof starts this is where you come in so here's how to support your institution your favorite institution if you are a student alumnus faculty friends staff prospective attendee or parent of a prospective attendee just go to facebook on our Facebook pages, Albert N E Okran or the Springboard Zone, and simply tell us which of the points your VC is sharing that you think is the most compelling. There, there's the main video, then there's the, the the snipers or insects, the one that gets the most engagement, the comments, activity around it is the winning university. So make sure your <laughs> university wins. Let's have this conversation big time on social media. Albert N E Okran or Springboard Zone on Facebook. Let's talk and multimedia group and graphic business are supporting this conversation big time. So Prof, what would be the first lesson you would like to drop for the benefit of our viewers and listeners? Well, my first lesson would be that you should own your personal and professional development. Whoa. If you're seeking to be at the top of your profession, if you're seeking to make a mark within your profession, you should learn to build your personal capacity and you should let it be your responsibility. So for instance, I wanted to be a lecturer and I wanted to rise up to the top, you know, be a professor. So I needed to understand for myself what that entailed, what I needed to do in order to become a professor. If you want to be an accountant, you need to find out for yourself, what does it mean for me to be an accountant? Is it by acquiring a bachelor's and a master's in accounting? Or I have to do some professional programs? Or I have to get a combination of these? And even while, while I do my professional programs, uh, do I need to get some practical training which will enable me to, to pass these exams uh, Quaker and to also uh, be a good practitioner. So you need to understand that it's not everything that we can teach in the classroom, you know. So you need to make it your personal responsibility, not your teacher's responsibility, not your mentor's responsibility, not your boss's responsibility, but your own personal responsibility. You know, everyone sees the end results, but we often do not see the process. It's only a few who see the, 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 the process. When the end result is there, we can all see it. Oh, she's a first female vice chancellor. Everybody sees that. But it's only few who have been very close to you 
who have had the experience of at least appreciating the process that you've been through. So you need to spend time and effort developing yourself, you know. Uh, we let, let me give the example of, 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 of Jesus Christ. He woke up very early in the morning to pray, you know, to go to a quiet place and pray. So we see that there was a consistent private prayer life and that resulted in a robust public ministry. Mm. Well, he, he, he had to commune with his, with his father to get strength from him and to also appreciate uh, the meat, the mission that he had assigned to him. So you need to spend time understanding what you require to get to the top of your profession. And you need to invest time in developing yourself beyond, you know, the, the usual and the obvious. Spend time developing yourself because a private prayer life was the key to a robust public ministry for the Lord Jesus Christ. So you, you say simple, yeah, how much more you... Okay, so that's the first lesson from Professor Nana Abba who says own your personal and professional development. Don't see it to your, your mentor, your teacher, your boss, or your parent. Prof, lesson number two. Lesson number two is that uh, be unfazed by obstacles because obstacles are bound to come on your leadership journey or whatever journey that you are on. And uh, you cannot get to the top if you break and back down at the least provocation. I mean, everyone who has been at the top will tell you that they've had their failures. It probably didn't work the first time. Uh, as a researcher, I've had uh, papers being rejected uh, by journals, but that did not stop me from pressing on. You know, there have been instances where you know people have, have felt that uh, you shouldn't be in this particular leadership space. You are probably running too too fast and too ahead of yourself. You know, people will try in sometimes subtle, but sometimes to very obvious ways to dissuade you to put obstacles in your way. You should not back down. You should be unfaced. If you do not have a resilient spirit, it's going to be tough for you to get right to the top. Have you ever found out that people who discouraged you, either directly or indirectly, were the same people who ever who turned around to rejoice when you made it? Oh, absolutely. You know, once you get to the top, you get a lot of friends and associates, you know, and everyone trying to associate with you, you know, but it, were, it wasn't everyone who encouraged you and even sometimes there was the deliberate effort to dissuade you and uh, pull you down. Is it a case that if people did not mean it or they realized they were wrong? Well, maybe they realized they were, I, I would like to think that they realized they were wrong. Uh, uh, but of course, uh, anyone in a leadership position, in a prominent position, you should know that by the mere fact of that position, you attract a lot of people to yourself. Don't assume that all of these are people who really care about you or who really love you. Maybe there's something that they stand to benefit uh, from the position that you are in so you must be aware of that yes you embrace you know everyone but you must be aware of the fact that it's the position not you <laughs> there's a relationship between your second point and your first point actually the first point is about only your development maybe the second point is about only your heart or your own resilience in a certain way absolutely yeah, because nobody will, will do it for you yeah. what will be your third point prof Nanaba? Uh, my third point is that you should look out for talent and nature such even on your journey to the top. Because a leader is not necessarily one who is all over the place doing everything, but he or she is the one who is able to identify the strengths of their team members and harness these for the benefit of the organization that they are doing. You know, uh, I'll give you an example. I, I love to write, you know. I, I believe that I'm a reasonably good writer. So That's I don't a have very <laughs> <understatement>. <laughs> 
<laughs> I don't have a problem putting my writings together, you know, uh, speeches and so on. But in the kind of work that I do, there's a lot of writing that is required, a lot of speeches that you have to put together, a lot of reports and all of those. If you don't have uh, team members who are good at that, who would help you to do these, you will not be able to, you know, to, to catch up with the demand of, of the job. You, know? you need people with different skills on your team uh, that you use to, to enhance your work. You essentially use to your benefit. And so as you go up, you should be able to identify talents and build them up so that you move up with these people. You cannot simply do it alone. You need a strong team to support you. I like the way you say, keep a lookout for talent and spot it quickly because sometimes their talents can be hidden in the team, doing something innocuous or doing the wrong, uh, playing the wrong position or role mm -hmm. and nobody notices that their gold material that mm -hmm. you shifted slightly yeah. could, could could bring you value yeah, but absolutely. what you're saying is that leader must beyond knowing your team also be able to spot talent that is being underutilized or not used at all yeah and channel them towards the effort yeah especially you know uh for 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 those of us who uh work in the public uh, sector mm -hmm. you you come and meet a team uh you would have to learn to work with the the, the team uh, you have, of course, I mean, you do have uh, opportunities every now and then to enhance these teams, to change roles, you know. But if, if you're going to change roles uh, for this to be effective, you need to know the strengths and the weaknesses of your team members and ensure that you are channeling the strengths in the right direction while you also help them to overcome their weaknesses. How do you deal with with people who, by virtue of your elevation and your position, you can see how good they can become, and you literally wish you could you could literally jolt them out of their slumber and push them, but you have the constraints of organizational hierarchy and the bureaucracy. How do you deal with that? I mean, some say it's easier in the private space than the public space. Help us to appreciate. You want somebody to do well. You spot what they can become. You, can, you are definite about it. But there's a system you're working with. How do you navigate that one? Well, yes, you're working within a system. Uh, but, you know, helping that person does not necessarily mean that bringing that person onto your immediate team, you know within the, the the roles that they are playing or within, I mean, if you take uh, uh, the University of Ghana, for instance, or any university, there are various departments, there are colleges, there are directorates, various units that we, we, we work with. I mean, for example, you know, there was an administrator that was in a particular unit, and I thought that she had strengths which would be better used in a different unit. I, need, I had a discussion with the registrar that I think that if we do these, you know, changes and the shifting of rules, it will work better, one, for the organization and also, two, for the individuals to develop the, those potentials that they have. Yes, and we did that and it's working pretty well. So, I mean, there are ways in which you can negotiate some of these things. I like the smile of your face talking about the negotiation <laughs> and being the guest chest with, yeah. with, 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 with your arms. I hope I'm not going ahead of myself, but Prof, in all this, you talked about get buy, getting buy-in from the registrar and so on. How critical is stakeholder engagement? If it's not one of your points, I would like to hear your thoughts on it for a minute before we go to your next point. Yeah, stakeholder engagement is absolutely necessary. I mean, you, you, you cannot, I don't think you can succeed as a university leader without adequate stakeholder uh, consultations. You know the universities, you know the professors, they will, they, they will talk, you know, they, 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 they would shout out if they think that you are not going 
in the right uh, direction, you know. And I also believe that even with the, the younger people, even with our students, you know, they have a wealth of ideas. Sometimes they are over exuberant and they don't channel their energies in the right direction. But you can help them to channel their energies in the right direction. You should provide avenues for listening to them. I mean, last year, for instance, we had the uh, VC stay with the SRC. And that was a day where I made myself available at the city, city conference center. The students were there, the auditorium were full, and I was on the spot for the students to ask whatever questions that they want. Oh, it went very well. <laughs> Explain, you know, some of the programs that we're trying to uh, put in place uh, with them. Not everybody would agree with you, you know, but, but by and large, Yes, yes, you allow yourself to be heard and then you give them the opportunity to also voice out their concerns and their contributions. So stakeholder engagement, it is absolutely critical. At various levels, you need to do that. You need to let the people that you are leading come along with you. Otherwise, you would keep going and when you look behind it, there'll be no one following you. Wow. Let's do some stakeholder engagement before we continue with our fourth point. If you are listening to us and you are a friend of Legon, a student of Legon, a faculty of Legon, a staff of Legon, a parent of a Legonite, or intending to go to Legon in the near future, please, which of the points that Professor Nana Abapiamfu has shared resonates with you and you think that's the one? She's talked about owning your personal and professional development. She's talked about in that regard, investing time and effort and not um, leaving it to your parent, your mentor, or your boss to do that for you. The second point has been about not being faced, being unfazed by obstacles. She says, listen, once you want to get to the top, there will be strong obstacles. You need to navigate them and it's very important. The third one is look out for talent and nature talent. And in that regard, engage stakeholders. Don't travel the journey alone. Prof, fourth point. Well, I, I, I think the, the what we just talked about, about stakeholder engagement, neatly, you know, dovetails into this one, which I would say that is value teamwork. Mm. Right. So I jumped the gun. I knew I, I, knew I was doing it. <laughs> so I'll put it under the fourth. So value teamwork. I love this. Tell yeah. me about it. Yeah, value teamwork. Uh, you need to work harmoniously with mm. everyone, with every member of the team, Yet you need to know your allies. You know, when you come into leadership, there are people who are enthusiastic about you, your ideas, what you bring on board, you know, and are very willing to go all lengths to support you to succeed. Then there'll be those who would be sitting on the fence, you know, let's see how things go. And then there are those, you know, who will sometimes even make the attempt to uh, sabotage you, let me put it that way, you know, uh, not, there are people who are, who, who are not eager to see you to succeed, you know. You cannot come and then just start to, you know, put people in different uh, boxes and decide that, you know, I'm going to work with only this set of people. Mm. Not when you are in an organization like I am, work with this set of people, but you not work with that set of people. Open up, give people the opportunity to prove themselves. That's why I say work harmoniously with everyone, but know your allies, know people that you put you give them certain critical assignment, certain assignments that when it goes wrong, you know, your whole agenda is derailed. And when you open up, you give people the opportunity. You would, you would even realize, you know, the wealth of uh, talent that you have. I always say that at the University of Ghana, there's a wealth of talent there. And my responsibility as a leader, as just to identify these and provide the conducive environment for these talents to flourish. And then I take credit for those. Beautiful. It's a simple formula. So you are giving us three categories of people that you will find on the journey. Those yeah. who are your allies, ready to go, happy, yeah. excited. Those who want to work and are happy that the thing works. Yes, they are in there. And then those who 
by and large, are not too excited. And you're mm -hmm. seeing work with all of them, but know the allies. And when it comes to serious things that are yeah. make or break, exactly. put them in the hands of trusted people. Don't Absolutely. gamble. Lovely, Absolutely. lovely, lovely. Absolutely. And then when it works, you just take the credit. That's, <laughs> That's it. All right. <laughs> Let's go to your fifth point, Professor Nabeb. <laughs> yes, my fifth point is that you need to understand the authority that you have, but keep your head low. Positions don't last forever. So you use the opportunity that you have now to build relationships that will endure beyond the tenure of your office. When you are, when you are positions, you know, people are ready to serve you, open doors for you, you know, carry your bags for you, do all kinds of things for you. But don't let that get too much into your head. As I mentioned earlier on, it's not really about you. It's about your position. It's about your office. And you need to know that you will not be there forever. We've seen that happen in Africa. We have presidents who stayed for, for, for years, sometimes even decades. But they eventually did get out of office, you know. And especially when you are in a position like mine, that you know very well that there is a cap on the, the, your tenure, you know, or you are the president of this nation, you know that maximum you cannot go beyond eight years. It's the same so what's, for. What's the cap on your it's the same. The, the, I mean, it's, it's a four year term, when and you can you, do a maximum of two terms, okay. not more than that. So you know. can actually count so, the, the year that you know, oh yes all things being equal, exactly ultimately. you come back to the floor <laughs> So you are saying that so, even though it will be nice to you, they will do yes. the favors and so on, they will, they will carry your bag, want to keep it in mind that you... It's not you, it is your office, it is your position. But then use that opportunity, you know, to, 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 to build friendships, to build relations that will last you beyond your tenure of office because the position opens up you know uh, it's, it's it's a very interesting one it allows you to network with a whole range of people you know from the top to the down so you need to take advantage of of, of that to build relationships to build relationships what's likely that to stay, happen you know? if a person gets so caught up in what they are doing that they don't stop to think that this will end one day what, in one word, what is likely to happen to, to them when they <laughs> end that turn? You know, you get out of office and the next day, you know, nobody uh, cares about you. Yeah. You know, you may you may enter an office, you know, for some work to be done. And and people, you know, may even just decide to, mm -hmm. uh, to, to decide to ignore you, you yeah. know. Uh, especially if you are one who was throwing your weight all about, you know, you know who I am, the kind of thing. Now you go there and what do you say? <laughs> Can you, you continue to say, do you know who I am? Who cares who you are? <laughs> beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. This is Springboard Russia University and today is Legon's Day, University of Ghana. And we are honored to have the Vice Chancellor, Professor Nanaba Apia. I'm for somebody I've known for decades, principled, diligent, and a leader in every respect. And it's an absolute honor to welcome her to the virtual university, sharing her five life lessons so far. Only your personal and professional development was number one. Two, be unfazed by obstacles. Three, look out for a nature talent. Four, value teamwork and stakeholder engagement. And the fifth one, understand the authority you have, but keep your head low because positions don't last forever. The break we are going for will not last forever. But when we come back from the break, let's go to that second one, the big one. What are her ideas for world-class education in Ghana? Please don't go away. <laughs> mm. <laughs> well, now that we're all here, um, I want to start by saying what a difficult year it has been for all of us. But then there's also a lot to be grateful for. You know, like when I bumped my car into a taxi right at our junction, and the insurance company paid my claims the very same day. And remember the surprise cash bonus we received for our funeral finance plan? 
that is what sponsored our trip to the beach. <laughs> and the song we sang all the way to Pra Pra. <laughs> I'm also grateful that every passing year brings me closer to enjoying the retirement benefits I have contributed so much to. And how since I started working from home after the COVID pandemic, I've been taking better care of myself. Even my doctor can attest to that. Speaking of that, I'm very grateful to the team at Transitions for giving Grandpa a befitting send -off. Well, on a happier note, I am grateful to have found an affordable office space to rent at Advantage Place. Enterprise, your advantage. Welcome back to Springboard, a virtual university, and to this amazing conversation on our show called The Don's Conclave. Springboard is brought to you by the Springboard Ratio Foundation and proudly sponsored by the Enterprise Group NTN Pulse UMB Bank with media support from the multimedia group and the graphic business who are backing these, this, this amazing series uh, throughout this month. So, Professor Nanaba Piangfu has been sharing with us her thoughts, her life lessons that include, among others, owning your personal and professional development, being unfazed by obstacles, looking out for a nurturing talent, valuing teamwork and stakeholder engagement, and the fifth one I love very much, almost like the warning to the Roman Caesar, <laughs> keep your foot on the ground, know the post you hold, but keep your feet firmly on the ground. Which of these points resonates with your own values in life? Let's, let's have the conversation on Facebook. Albert, N.E. Okran, or Springboard Zone. Tell me which is your favorite on the videos, on the snippets, and also on the post, the slides that have been posted. Prof, let's go to that big one. I tell you what, we've been running a series called My Top 10. And when we get to the ideal Ghana, yeah. everyone talks about education. Everyone yeah. seems to have an opinion about education. But let's yeah. learn from somebody at the highest level yeah. in managing education. Yeah. Prof, if you are the magic one, if you were ultimately responsible for education in the whole country, which you, to a large extent are in the place that you operate, what would be your five top prescriptions for world-class education in Ghana? Let's start with your number one. Okay. That my goal as vice chancellor will be for the university to train students who are critical thinkers, mm -hmm. technologically adept, humane, culturally sensitive, and ready to provide leadership for the country and the continent. Mm. So many of the things that I'm going to say, or many of the points, uh, sort of emanate from this. So my first point as a prescription for world-class education is for us to focus on critical thinking and analytical skills. Students should be encouraged to critically analyze information from a variety of sources. We must direct them to look for information and critically engage with such. Route learning hasn't helped us. I recently, you know, uh, watched a video where a teacher was in class uh, speaking and the students just repeating after the teacher. Uh, the book is under the table. Then they will repeat the book is under the table. The book is on the table. Then they repeat the book is on the table. And then the teacher asks, where is the book? And then they responded, where is the book? Oh. <laughs> you know, and it was just a struggle for the teacher to let them know that 
this is a question that I want you to respond to because they were just parroting and <laughs> repeating everything that the teacher said in class. And unfortunately, we do quite a bit of that in our system. We need to shift. And you know, the shift has to start right from the basic level through secondary to the tertiary level. As a researcher, while these points are self-evident, would you say that your work as a researcher has influenced this point becoming your number one? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, how can you become an effective uh, researcher when you cannot look at data and then identify patterns in there? Uh, you cannot, you know, uh, identify outliers. You cannot critically engage with literature and data. That's a, a very important skill for researchers. And it is not just for researchers, you know, literally anybody who seeks to be in a leadership or management uh, position, you need to be able to think critically. I can relate to this as a pastor very, very easily. Mm -hmm. I mean, you talked about analyzing data, observing patterns, yeah. noticing outliers, yeah. and using those to make critical decisions. I mean, mm -hmm. take something as, as mundane as church attendance. Mm -hmm. Why do people come for some particular services or in some months or in some days mm -hmm. of the month more mm -hmm. than others? Mm -hmm. And what are the outliers? Mm -hmm. and, and how do you use that to plan yeah. logistics, that presentations, mm -hmm. messages? Mm -hmm. It is so relatable as you, as mm -hmm. you make this point. Mm -hmm. You are saying that rote learning hasn't helped us. No. So we must challenge the students to do more critical thinking and analysis mm -hmm. because yeah. Ultimately, that's what they will need in real life. That is a prof point that number two it. on world-class yeah. education. Yeah. My point number two is for us to encourage creativity. We need to create avenues for students to explore their creative sites. You know, music, art, performance. Uh, we tend to focus too much on the on the academic <laughs> side of things and uh, very often we are actually testing you know how much you can remember <laughs> not even apply how much you can remember so a world-class education should be utilitarian you know it should be utilitarian it's, it's it's actually a bad thing for us to even punish students for getting things wrong. You know, remember those days, mental, you know, yeah, <laughs> one plus three, yeah. and <laughs> you get it wrong and you are beating up and all of that. It, 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 it even makes, you know, certain pupils and students hate some subjects, you know, hate to come to, to, to school, you know. And for all you know, these people have creative sites that if we provided the environment we provide them, them with the needed support, you know, they would excel, you know, once we allow their creative sides to thrive. Let me share an example that you find very interesting about children with special needs mm -hmm. and learning learning challenges. I was interviewing a, a musician, mm -hmm. Bachi Kwame, uh, about his earlier days in education. Mm -hmm. And he was apparently dyslexic, so he could mm. not relate to some subjects. And his parent, his father was apparently an accountant, a chief accountant or something mm. like that. So how can his son not yeah. relate to One math? <laughs> and he says, he used his own words, he says yeah. he was significantly abused <laughs> by, his, by his teacher with mm -hmm. the support of his parents. Yeah. Because they wanted him to do so well. Mm -hmm. And he says the more mm -hmm. they beat him, the more he hated education. Until he chanced on someone who tried to convert all his learnings into music, artistic ways and he says he flourished so well having previously done poorly in the same yeah. exam because mm -hmm. someone could adapt yeah. to his way of processing and help him yeah. to I mean how how do we provision for people with learning challenges and learning difficulties who probably are even more adept at the creative side of things yeah so a number of things uh, we need to uh, look at the training of our teachers at all levels right uh, because you know and especially at the lower levels the pupils have a lot of confidence in their teachers i don't know whether you have attempted to uh, correct some wrong that a teacher is you know <laughs> teaching your child 
you you may come up you know against an argument with your child and my teacher says so you know and i'm going back to school to face my teacher how am i going to tell my teacher that you know my mom or my dad dad says that it should be different so i mean teachers play a critical role you know in shaping and molding the knowledge systems of our children and so we need to look at how we are training these teachers we need to look at the way that we teach in class to get it to be more interactive you know and that also has to do with resources mm. because you know the smaller your class the more interactive you can make it to become if you have large classes there's a limit to the interaction that you can allow to happen in class right and we need to also in our ways of assessing we shouldn't just uh, assess based on memory you know we should have a range of it yes memory is part of it but we should also uh, provide the kinds of assessment that allows for our students to apply you know that allows for our students to exhibit their analytical skills right and then we need to invest we we, we essentially need to invest a, a lot more in education we need to make it appealing for people look i know people and i'm sure you also do know people who would love to teach but they think that it's 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 non-lucrative you know <laughs> to to teach and so they would rather do something else even their parents will encourage them to to do something else look i can tell you a story of a mate of mine at at, at legon and uh, when she was in her final year uh, the mom who was a flourishing uh, trader at uh, mokola asked her what so now we are about to uh, finish school what are you going to do and she said i would love to go into teaching i love to teach she said the mom said uh, thank you you know for letting me for letting my money go waste you know imagine and we we need to get our brightest and our best in teaching like happens in 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 finland right and we need to also provide the conducive environment if you if you have smaller classes then you can pay more attention to uh students who have uh, special who have special needs right at, at the University of Ghana for instance uh, one of the things we're doing to enhance our student experience is to equip our assistive technology lab mm. so that our students with a visual impairment they are not left behind in our technologically in our technological drive in our drive to use more technology in our teaching and learning so all of these things cost money and we need to plan for that and put in our resources put your money where your heart oh, is and exactly. so far we're talking about critical thinking and analytical skills and then two creativity mm. what will be your mm. third my third is for us to encourage lifelong learning mm. <laughs> when i came in we were talking about you know <laughs> comfort and ruling in in in, yeah, in, in, yeah. in the program you know and I must say that learning should not be confined to the classroom, nor to the period of one's studentship. Albert, I'm sure that a lot of uh, skills that you are using now and a lot of knowledge that you are using now, you probably didn't learn this when you were in the classroom. How many years ago some decades more than you know two two decades ago and i'm making reference to the first Crazy, degree yeah. yes but if you decided to stop learning the day you left school i would say that was the day that you became you know intellectually dead mm. the day you stop learning you become intellectually dead <laughs> and irrelevant to your society very <laughs> tough but very real <laughs> So that's your point number three. What will be your number four, Prof? Yeah, my number four is uh, make use of technology. And anybody who has followed me since I became vice chancellor know that the two concepts driving, you know, my uh, my, my 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 leadership is technology and uh, humanism. 
So we are in a technologically age. We are in a technological age. And so for me, irrespective of discipline, our graduates should be technologically adept, right? We need to incorporate technology in our teaching and learning and in small and big ways, you know. For instance, I mean, I, since I, I, I became dean, I will not accept a letter from a student which is handwritten. No way. I mean, that's, basic. that's a basic, you know, that's the basic. Go and type it, you know. Who receives a, a handwritten letter in this day? That's, that's, that's a base, very basic, you know. You force when you do so. So, for instance, you know, you let you, you insist that your students should type the assignments. That's a very basic. It will force them uh, to engage. allow students to actually type their exams on, on computers? Oh, yes, yes. I mean, so, uh, for instance, we have a learning management system that we are using, and you can take the tests on the on on on, on the computers, you know, and uh, you, you, I mean, there are various options for you to, to do that. And in fact, we are promoting that. Uh, in, in, in last year, April, I, I launched the vice chancellor's uh, program to enhance the UG student experience wow. and technology is central to to that and so we are seeking what, what to is it, what does the program do oh they very quickly there are three components you know there's a classroom modernization which we are equipping our classrooms putting in the needed uh, projectors interactive boards even making it possible so that uh, you can if you had to travel for a conference as a lecturer you can be there, you know, and deliver your lecture. You can have students outside of the lectures for some of the classrooms. You cannot do it for every classroom. Okay. They would be out of the classroom, but they could tune in. It's a way of also managing our, our numbers without a brick and mortar solution. So classroom modernization. The second one quickly is the one student, one laptop, where we seek to use innovative ways to uh, provide our students with laptop. When I'm ending, when I'm, when I'm ending this show, I'm going to ask yeah. you if somebody wanted to support the Vice Chancellor's uh, initiative, what, what should they do? Who should they call? But that will be when we are ending. So yeah. three components, classroom modernization, one student, the one, one laptop. laptop. The, third one. the third one is a hot spot comfort zones. Mm. Uh, but when we were in Legon, you know, everywhere was close to everywhere. There were only five halls close to the teaching areas. But now we have expanded. We even have non-resident students. Students come to campus and in between the lectures, they don't have comfortable places to stay at. So we want to create these comfort, comfort zones. They are hotspot enabled. So you can go there in between your lectures to relax. You can finish up an assignment. You can do your quick reading before going to your next lesson. Mm -hmm. I, the smile of your face is talking about these things is infectious. But let me ask you, will there be a day when having provided students with one student, one laptop, mm -hmm. students can actually write their exams with laptops? Instead yes. of, as part of your technology drive, instead of writing with pen and paper. Oh yes, oh yes, and it's happening now. It's happening now in some instances. The, 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 the only thing is that we need to uh, upscale these, uh, get proctoring software uh, so that uh, students, you know, proctoring software allows for uh, remote invigilation, you know. I wish we wouldn't have to do that, but that to one. safeguard the integrity <laughs> of, 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 of our exams. So, so yes, yes the, that, is, that is going on. Less, exactly. I, I, I was going to go can, to that. Can, yes. can exactly. You can have an open book open exam book and exam. it's more difficult yeah. than... I'm coming back to you, but I'm telling you. Okay, last one. The fifth and last one. Yes, yeah, so the fifth and last one is that we should cultivate global perspectives grounded in local context. We cultivate mm. global perspectives grounded in local context. Explain. You know? We need to make our students understand the connectedness of today's world while appreciating the uniqueness of our specific environment. Uh, so if I can give an, a, an example, um, the use of technology in healthcare delivery, right? Uh, so the uh, advanced countries who are seeking to use technology to enhance the healthcare delivery, 
to even you know do diagnosis and 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 so on that's a brilliant idea you know and uh, the applications that are allowing them to do that now if you want to, and that's some, something that we also need to think about but if, if you're going to bring uh, something like that into our context you need to appreciate the nature of the population that we have you know the literacy levels that we have the access to sophisticated <laughs> phones and so on that we have and then you have to tailor make the solution to our context and you need to also understand uh, our priorities maybe for us you know sitting in front of the doctor and having that chat alone you know is like 50 percent of your you know of your sickness you gone <laughs> You are sick and you gone already and you so if you're going to uh, provide a totally faceless uh, system is that going to work in our context to what extent uh, can we you know use all of these technological innovations you need to appreciate your context we, we need to encourage our societies to be efficient in whatever we do but we don't need to discount you know the cultural uh, and societal uh, specificities. You know what? Our time is up, but I just would like to ask you which of your achievements in the past few months as VC gives you the most fulfillment? What gives me the most fulfillment as uh, uh, providing the technological devices uh, for our students? Look, I can tell you the story of the student who was one of our very first recipients. In fact, this person sent an email uh, to my, my, my office. He, he said he didn't even think that we were going to respond, you know, let alone to uh, provide that need. And he is forever uh, indebted. When we did our first disbursement of the laptop for the needy students, the students who, who some of the students who received the emails, they said they thought it was a scam. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, so generally providing that environment that enhances our student experience. Because you know what? I believe that a committed alum starts with a satisfied student. I believe so too. Let me ask you about the VC's program. If somebody wanted to um, support it, what should they do? Yeah, if they go to our website, you know, you, you look for University of Ghana, you go to our website, uh, there is a tab which allows you, when you click on it, support the VCs initiatives or something like that. When you click on it, you would have the uh, needed, the information that you need to uh, support us. But the office that is coordinating all of these is the office of the Pro Vice Chancellor for Academic and Student Affairs. So you can also reach out to that office and you get that information. <laughs> Before we go, in just a minute, you talked about the two portals, the two pillars that drive your work as VC mm. being technology and the second mm. one being humanism. That's right. Take a minute before we go to tell us humanism, what exactly? Yes, so we need to, you know, sometimes when we are embroiled in all that we do, we tend to forget that the center or the core of all that we do is the human being, is the student, right? Uh, university education and education for that matter is for the public good, is to ensure that the life of that person accessing education is improved and then it affects the person's relations and the person's uh, community. So as we set out our policies, as we set out our plans, I always want my staff and faculty to keep the student at the center of it, mm. you know, to, to keep the human being at the center of it, not just the student, but also the staff and faculty. What can we do to ensure that students are comfortable? What can we do to ensure that our staff are comfortable and they will do the things that they have to do without compulsion? Prof, before you sign off um, with a message to the public about why Ligon and nowhere else. Let me remind our listeners and viewers about the points you've shared. You talked about own your personal and professional development. The second one is, was beyond phase by obstacles. 
The third one is look out for and nurture talent. The fourth is about value teamwork and stakeholder engagement. And the fifth one is keep your feet on the ground. I like, I like that part. Just know your authority, but keep your feet on the ground. And on your prescriptions for world-class education, number one, you said critical thinking and analytical skills. Number two, you said creativity for students to also explore their creative sides. Number three is to encourage lifelong learning, like the virtual university. Number four is make use of technology. And the fifth one is cultivate global perspectives grounded in the local context. For you watching out there, which one is your favorite? Let's have this debate on Facebook, Albert and E. Okran and on Springboard Zone, both on Facebook. Let's debate these perspectives contribute comments and let's see Ligon rise to the top through these engagements. Prof, for the benefit of everyone watching out there, tell them why why Ligon in a minute. Why Ligon? Well for the past 75 years the University of Ghana has been engaged in training top quality human resource for the nation, the continent and indeed the world. Uh, we've also been engaged in cutting-edge uh, research which has contributed to the advancement and the development not just of our nation but also of the continent. These are things that we do best and we do that in a holistic environment where we try to nurture not just the intellectual potential of our student but also their creative and sporting uh, potential. University of Ghana is the place to go, nowhere else. We are in our 75th year and we've gotten finer and better and that is where you have to come to. Whoa, that's a powerful <laughs> sales pitch. I tell you what, the sporting bit club coming to your, your sporting facilities are getting better and better yes. by the day. We can't wait to, to come and see you when it's completed, the new mm. stadium, the ultra modern mm. stadium. Mm. Uh, Professor Na Abafian for University of Ghana Vice Chancellor, thanks for spending time with us on the very first edition of our brand new series on the Don's Conclave. It's a, it's a bringing together the minds of heads of tertiary institutions and definitely we'll continue this debate um, on, on social media about the thoughts you shared and I like the humanism and the fact that one financially challenged student can receive a laptop and see I thought it was a scam mm -hmm. and use that to enhance their learning knowing mm -hmm. that one day ultimately he can actually write his exams on his laptop mm -hmm. it's a new season mm -hmm. I want to say a big yeah. thank you to you for coming mm -hmm. thank you thank you Actually, I, I had an alum today, just before I came here, you know, bringing us two laptops and he said he read a testimony on Facebook about a student who received this and the student said he is definitely going to give back. Mm. So if you are an alumnus, <laughs> please get those laptops and send them to the, the University of Ghana mm. to support this program and definitely come put and I will play our part in supporting the Vice Chancellor's program. So. So we come away again next week. My name is Albert Okran, thanking you on behalf of the Springboard Roadshow Foundation and our sponsors, the Enterprise Group, MTN Pulse, UMB Bank, our media partners, the Multimedia Group, and the Graphic Business. On Tuesday, find this full story with Professor Naba Pianfu on page 18 of the Graphic Business. And let's continue the conversation, which is your favorite of the points you shared, Albert A. E. Okran and Springboard Zone on Facebook. So we do this again next week. My name is Albert Okran saying God bless you, God bless you, and God bless you. Do, do, do.